How did a bakery in Yonkers, New York, a small, slightly disheveled city next door to the Bronx, end up not only making cakes for the rich and famous, but supporting the poor and disenfranchised? The bakery we're talking about is the Grayston Bakery, a social experiment that started more than 20 years ago with the goal of employing the chronically unemployed, getting them off the streets and back into the workforce. Not only that, the profits from the bakery, and the bakery does make a profit, are used to help fund daycare centers, health clinics, and counseling services. Today, the Grayston Bakery has become a role model for companies that want to inject some social action into their business. So come with us to a bakery like no other. The Grayston Bakery is located in an old building in a section of Yonkers where the well-heeled do not walk. Where inside a few cramped rooms, the bakers make gourmet cakes which are served at the finest restaurants. Cheesecake, chocolate cakes, mousse cakes. They also bake wedding cakes and cakes which have been served at the White House. It's a five million dollar a year business. But the bakery doesn't hire people to make cakes. It makes cakes to hire people. People like Rodney Johnson, a former drug dealer. He got his GED in jail and his first legal job here at Grayston. You were making five dollars an hour when you started working at the bakery? Yes. What were you making in the streets? A good week? Two thousand. How did you manage to stick with the job paying five dollars an hour when you could make a couple of thousand a week in the streets? I had a child wanting to show her something different. And he says his drug dealing taught him some useful job skills. When it comes to having a job to get done, uh, you know, we try to, at the bakery, we try to meet that quota. You know, on the streets, when I had X amount of drugs, I try to meet that quota. <laughs> it's business. Business. But, um... At the end of the day, I don't have to uh, worry about police coming. I don't have to uh, stash crack. I don't have to run into buildings, things of that nature. No. Rodney makes cakes and brownies now. He says he owes much of his turnaround in life to Julius Walls, the CEO of the bakery, who gave him and others like him a chance. You are employing people who are generally considered by most businesses in this country to be? Unemployable. Hard to employ. You get the crumb structure a little tighter, it'll give a better oh, mouthfeel. Walls was studying to be a Catholic priest, but left that calling to have a family and enter the business world. He now calls Grayston his ministry, and he believes anyone, anyone, deserves a chance to work. We get people who are straight out of prison. We have people who are just coming out of substance abuse programs and, and need an opportunity to, to make a go of their lives. Um, we have people who are returning uh, to work from their roles. And rehab centers and probation officers know that you're a man to call. Yes, absolutely. The bakery has a unique hiring policy. Every other Wednesday is open hiring day. Applicants gather outside the bakery. If you've got one job opening, for example, and you've got two applicants, and one of them is a clean-cut high school kid, and another one is off the street, how do you make up your mind? How do, how do you do it? It is somewhat by chance, because uh, we number the applications. And so... Uh, whichever guy showed up first. Whichever guy showed up first. Most new employees start out as apprentices working on the brownie line, where the work is repetitive and the temperature can get up to 90 degrees. About half drop out, but the other half go on to get full-time jobs with decent pay and benefits. Why run it for profit? Why not just run it as a charity? We understand that most people that come to work for us are going to stay with us forever and they're going to have to go out and um, work for someone else and we want them to understand what it means to have a real job. The bakery employs some 65 people. People like Delaney Philogene, who left Haiti as a child and became a homeless teenage mother. Delaney, how old were you when you came to this country? Eleven. And you've been on your own since? Fourteen, fifteen. Was life pretty rough? Sure. And at some point I ended up being in a shelter and stayed there for about a good couple of months or so. And I didn't think that was a good thing for me either. And I got pregnant and left school. How did you land it? I applied and they told me to keep in touch. And so I went to Grayson every morning and I stood in front and waited until a position was given to me. And one day they told me they had a full week's work for me and uh, I was so excited. Today, Delaney works in accounting at Grayston and provides a stable home for herself and her two children. And Rodney, who's been at Grayston nine years, is the production manager of the entire bakery. 
Does it make a difference that you're making very fine bakery products as opposed to doorknobs? You know, there's a little more love and finesse put into a cake as, as opposed to a, a doorknob, unless it's an elegant doorknob for a mansion. <laughs> but uh, no, nah, I like cakes. Cakes are good. Cakes have been good to me. Specifically, these cakes, with names like Peanut Butter Explosion, Venetian Wine Cake, and their best seller, Triple Chocolate Mousse. How many calories do you think are sitting on this table? Ah, uh, zero. Zero. <laughs> that's, that's what I was hoping you'd say. This is such an interesting cake. This is a lotus in mud. It has a lotus flower in muddy waters. Is this the flower? That's the lotus flower, well, handmade uh, from buttercream. What might that be? Buttercream? Like, buttercream. Mm. Uh, again, sure made from is. scratch and made with real butter. Um, and this cake... You sure uh, it's real butter? I should you should try, try again. again. Yeah, yeah, check it again, check it again. <laughs> Perhaps. Greaston Cakes retail for about $35 and are sold at gourmet food shops, on the internet, and at upscale restaurants. Do these famous restaurants where you sell your cakes know who's making them? Some do, some don't, don't know at all. Uh, I mean, the most interesting thing about, uh, about most of the famous restaurants who I can't name is because uh, they actually put the cakes out and say they make them. If Greaston's an unusual place, it had an unusual founder. Tony Glassman from Brooklyn was a Jewish aerospace engineer who said goodbye to all that and became a Buddhist priest with a bent for social activism. I wanted to show that people that are homeless, if they're given the chance and the right training, could not only work in our labor force, but can produce the high niche items of our, of our society. They can produce items so that only you, the French chefs could create. Did it go very smoothly at the beginning, or were there a lot of, a lot of problems, a lot of obstacles? We had a tremendous amount of obstacles. We almost went broke a few times. The bakery, which started in 1982, struggled for years until it struck up a deal with Ben & Jerry's, the Vermont ice cream company with a social conscience. Ben & Jerry's hired Grayston to make extra thin brownies for ice cream sandwiches. It was the biggest customer the little bakery had ever had. And according to Ben Cohen, Ben in Ben & Jerry's, there was a problem with the first batch of those extra thin brownies. What went wrong? The brownies all stuck together and they clumped up into this 50 pound block of brownie. When we got these huge blocks of 50 pound brownies, it was really hard to pull them apart and mostly we got little bits of brownies. And we said, well, what can we do with these little bits of brownies? We said, well, we'll try shoving them in ice cream and make chocolate fudge brownie ice cream. And that's how Eureka. the flavor came into being. The brand of flavor. <laughs> in fact, today, Grayston brownies are in three of Ben & Jerry's top-selling flavors, including, of course, chocolate fudge brownie. The bakery makes 11,000 pounds of brownies a day just for Ben & Jerry's. All the bakery's profits go into the Grayston Foundation, a nonprofit organization that runs programs for needy families in Yonkers, whether or not they work for the bakery. The foundation's funding doesn't only come from the brownies. It comes from grants, from other business ventures, from private donations. And the idea is that giving people jobs is fine, but it's not enough. People also need decent housing and daycare for their kids, or how else could they keep their jobs? And the foundation offers even more, including a computer class for school-age kids and a clinic for people who are HIV positive. Angela Rodriguez came to Grayston's HIV clinic more than four years ago, after she learned that she'd been infected by her husband, who has since died of AIDS. I wanted to die. At that moment, I wanted to die. And I went into a deep depression because I didn't know how to handle the situation. She was terrified of the future and furious at her late husband. When I came in, I was a very angry person. I would dig out my husband out of the grave and kill him again. Every time I got angry, I would take him out and kill him and put him back, you know. And this anger just kept building up and up and up. Well, she got her anger down after working with counselors at Grayston. She also got her life back on track. She works at Grayston now as a part-time receptionist, 
She's taking some college courses and hopes to become an HIV counselor. Has Grayston given you hope for the future? Oh, Grayston has given me more than hope for the future. Grayston has given me my life back. Another success story for the Grayston Foundation? Jamila Shabazz and her family. She was unemployed for years, not because she didn't want to work, but because she was afraid to leave her kids alone in the drug-infested neighborhood where they lived. Where I was living, my children, one, they could not ever go outside and play because it was too dangerous. Dangerous because? Because of the drugs, because of the guns, and you the fighting constantly. That all changed when Jamila and her family moved into a safe, clean, low-rent apartment owned by the Grayston Foundation. It also came an unimaginable luxury, daycare. The daycare was great. It was a great feeling to know that your children are safe. Jamila found a job working with kids, and her oldest son, Kevin, got a scholarship from the Grayston Foundation to help pay for college. What kind of future do you see for you and your family now? My daughter, my son, they're going to do well. I'm blessed. I'm very blessed. The little bakery that started it all is about to become a bigger bakery, which will presumably help more people. The Grayston Bakery is about to move into a new building designed by architect Maya Lin, whose past projects include the Vietnam Memorial in Washington. We were going to try to get light to filter through all levels of the bakery. The building she designed is nothing like the cramped space the bakery's in now. She wanted a clean, well-lighted place with high ceilings and low construction costs. I couldn't resist getting drawn into it. One, because of what they do. Two, it's sort of a very happy, very fun, very challenging um, design problem. When it's finished, Grayston hopes to be able to employ nearly twice as many people and quadruple its profits. It's interesting that what you're really into are good works, mm -hmm. and you've discovered that running a profitable business is a better way to do good works than running a charity. That's right. Do good and do well. It's called a double bottom line. Our social mission is as important as our business mission. Our people are as important as the dollars we make. And he hopes people will keep that in mind when they're shopping for dessert. Let them eat cake, huh? Let them eat cake. <laughs>